Yeah, so good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being with us for this very special event. Um, I'm Shweb M. Khan. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the Human Rights Lawyers Association. Um, for those unfamiliar with the association, we are an organization open to anyone who works in human rights law uh, or indeed who has a, an interest in human rights law. We have over 2,000 members right now, which includes solicitors, barristers, judges, academics, and students. Um, so please do consider joining the association um, if you're not a member or have a look at the website for further details. Um, we do regularly try to hold events such as this on various human rights related topics, um, even though um, the panel we have today is not something we can really promise you, we can offer you every time, the amazing panel we have today. Um, but please do have a look at the website and consider joining us. Um, I will just go through some general housekeeping, introduce our chair for this evening, and then I will hand over to her. Um, firstly, the event is being recorded, just so everyone is aware of that. Um, there is no Q&A at, uh, at the end, um, but the chat facility has been enabled. So feel free um, um, to um, send us any messages or if you wish to contribute to the discussion, express your own views about Lord Kerr um, or share any views, please feel free to use the chat facility. Um, a huge thanks to all our speakers um, and to our host, Hogan, Hogan Lovells. Um, as always, they have been really generous with the HRLA in hosting us and facilitating our events. Um, it is an absolute privilege and pleasure to be joined by so many amazing human rights lawyers today. Um, so a huge thanks to all of them for being here today. Our chair this evening is the chair of the Human Rights Lawyers Association, Aswini Viraratne QC. She is a barrister at Doughty Street. She, her practice focuses on protecting the most vulnerable in society. She has extensive experience of investigative procedures, inquests, etc. Um, she appears in courts at all levels, including the Supreme Court and the ECHR. Um, she sits as a part-time judge, and we're delighted that she took over as chair of the HRLA just a few months ago in December 2020. So this is the first HRLA event that she's taken part in since she became chair, um, which we are really delighted about. Um, I will now pass over to her. So Aswini, thank you. Um, thank you, Sharab, and hello to everyone. So welcome to this special uh, event in memory of Lord Kerr. We have an impressive lineup, as Sharab has mentioned, of eminent lawyers who will share their memories of Lord Kerr with us all tonight. And I know there'll be many others out there who will have wanted to contribute their stories, and I can only apologise that we're limited by time and Zoom to this small event. I'm pleased to say that his family, Lady Kerr, sons John and Patrick, and niece Nyasa are joining us to listen in. And so on behalf of everyone here, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you and to offer sincere condolences to the whole family. So we are here to remember Brian Francis Kerr, Lord Kerr of Tunnamore, and his massive contribution to law and justice. This could be a somber and sad event, but I suspect that with his reputation as a kind and modest man with an impish sense of humor and down to earth attitude, we will hear some lively stories when, I, uh, when he chaired a, a children's rights event I was speaking at, we were all immediately required to call him Brian, which to me didn't feel nearly respectful enough. Some brief background, if it's needed, is that Lord Kerr became a Justice of the Supreme Court in 2009, having previously served as Lord Chief Justice of Northern Ireland. He was the last Lord of Appeal in Ordinary appointed before the creation of our modern Supreme Court and so an inaugural member of the Supreme Court where he was the first justice from Northern Ireland. His passing in December 2020 was sudden and came just two months after his retirement. Lord Reid, the president of the Supreme Court said that justices and staff alike were shocked at the news. Lord Kerr was called to the Bar of Northern Ireland in 1970 and to the Bar of England and Wales in 74 and at Gray's Inn. As one might expect of a justice of the Supreme Court, Lord Kerr had the most distinguished of legal careers. He became a High Court judge at just the age of 44. He practiced through the Troubles era in Northern Ireland, through internment and diplock courts. More recently, he spoke, spoke of the difficulty of being a judge in Northern Ireland and that he accepted that nomination because it was the right thing to do. Lord Reid, again, the current president, said that Lord Kerr had been more determined than most to correct injustice where he saw it 
which let it to be described as the conscience of the court. I don't need to provide a list of cases and judgments, but I will say that Lord Kerr was a staunch defender of judicial review. He said that what the judiciary provides is a vouching or checking mechanism for the validity of laws that Parliament has enacted or the appropriate international treaties to which we have subscribed. The last thing we want is for the government to have access to unbridled power. And who could disagree with that? And he was a vocal supporter of the Human Rights Act. He said that the central point of the act is that it has given judges free access to the rich vein of jurisprudence that is provided by Strasbourg. I think it is a very healthy thing for the judges in our jurisdiction to be prepared not to follow slavishly all the utterance of the European Court. That said, we now have the ability to draw on jurisprudence from all over the Council of Europe on matters that critically affect the balance of power between the citizen and the state, and I think that can only be a good thing, he said. So I'd like to turn now with that brief introduction to our 12 contributors, contributors who range from those at the top of their careers and one who has recently embarked on hers and was Lord Kerr's last judicial assistant. Again, I'm sure there are legions of others who would love to share their fond memories of Lord Kerr, and I'd invite you please to share those memories using the chat function if you wish. So brief introductions for all those who are actually going to uh, share their memories. First, we have Dinah Rose QC, who practices from Blackstone Chambers. Her particular areas of interest include human rights, civil liberties and discrimination law. Dinah uh, was appointed president of, the, of Magdalen College, Oxford, last year, becoming the first woman to hold that post. Thank you, Dinah. Thank you very much, Aswini. There have been many brilliant and wise judges who've sat in the House of Lords and in the Supreme Court but I can't think of any who have been not only respected, but loved as deeply as Lord Kerr was loved. His loss last year feels unbearable, not only because of his very significant contribution to the law and particularly to human rights and equality law, but most particularly because of his personality. Lord Kerr's empathy, his humanity, his compassion and his concern for the vulnerable shone through his judgments. As a barrister appearing in court in front of him, he was simply a joy. He was thoughtful, responsive, even chatty, and there was always a twinkling, impish sense of humour that teased counsel but never attempted to wound. I have so many memories of Lord Kerr, but I want to share just two of them with you. The first is an occasion a couple of years ago when he invited me out to lunch with some of the Supreme Court judicial assistants, all of whom were young women seeking careers at the bar. Lord Kerr's concern was to introduce us to each other in order to give them the space to ask questions and share experiences with me as a more senior woman at the bar. And he did so in the most stylish way, giving us a wonderful and rather boozy lunch at a fabulous restaurant. The time and trouble that he took on that day to advance the careers of women and to do so not by giving worthy speeches on diversity, but by a simple practical step based on the premise that everybody should have fun and enjoy themselves was entirely characteristic of him. The second memory I want to share concerns a case in which I played a very minor role for interveners as one of many counsel, and indeed I know a number of other counsel who were in that case are here this evening. It was a case that was particularly close to Lord Kerr's heart concerning the prohibition on abortion in Northern Ireland in cases of rape, incest and fatal fetal abnormality. I recall in that case Lord Kerr's determined focus on the appalling experiences that individual women had endured. His judgment began by telling their devastating stories in their voices from their witness statements. And then he said this, the courage of these women in giving unsparing accounts of their experiences is wholly admirable. It is impossible not to feel profound sympathy for their plight and for the ordeal that each of them has had to endure. Admiration and sympathy do not provide an answer to the complex questions 
which arise on this appeal, however. A dispassionate analysis of those questions is required. But the nature of their suffering and the trauma of their experiences are by no means irrelevant to the unraveling and resolution of the issues to which this appeal gives rise. The judgment that Lord Kerr went on to give, finding breaches not only of Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, but also of Article 3, the prohibition on inhuman and degrading treatment, was infused by his appreciation of that trauma. As part of his conclusion, Lord Kerr said this, speaking with all the authority of his long life and career in Northern Ireland. I have difficulty in understanding how the moral values of the population of Northern Ireland permit abortion to take place when there's a threat of serious long-term ill health to the mother, but forbid it where that cannot be said to be present, but the mother finds the pregnancy repugnant and a constant reminder of the sexual abuse to which she has been subjected. The dignified understatement of that passage, making clear at once his compassion for the women and his revulsion at the cruelty of the morality invoked against them was the essence of everything that Lord Kerr stood for. We lost him much too suddenly and much too soon. I'm proud to have known him and to have had him as a mentor for a number of years. As we say in traditional Jewish mourning, may his memory be for a blessing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dino. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Hugh Southey QC, a barrister at Matrix Chambers, and he specializes in public law and in a wide range of fields, including human rights, immigration and discrimination law. And he's litigated in a number of jurisdictions, including Northern Ireland. So Hugh, please. Uh, thank you, Sweeney. Uh, thank you, Dinah. Um, I, I found preparing for this actually quite difficult because um, Lord Kerr, my, for me, was very different, I think, to any other judge I've appeared before. When I heard the news about Lord Kerr, Kerr I broke down in tears, and I can't imagine doing that about any other judge. It, it really was a very emotional and very personal loss that I suffered. And the reason for that, to be frank, is he was just such a warm person. And um, one example of that, and it is only one example, as many of you know, I came back from fairly major surgery about just over two years ago. And the first case I ended up doing uh, was in the Privy Council, and it was before Lord Kerr. And uh, it was a slightly frightening experience, to be frank, because the surgeons told me I was ready to go back, but I wasn't entirely sure. And so I ended up writing to the court and asking for various uh, uh, accommodations to be made. And as I walked into court, or rather as the court walked into court, I was obviously already sitting there, I stood up as you do. And Lord Kerr just gestured with this big smile, sit down, sit down, because he knew what had gone on and it just put me at my ease. And after that, I would, uh, because I fly to Belfast regularly, I'd regularly see him at either Heathrow or Belfast City and he would always be asking about my health and the way he just welcomed me back was something that will stick with me forever and uh, as I may explain part of as I say my emotion but more generally I think as an advocate as Dinah said he was someone who uh, wanted to help you by relaxing you and uh, whether it was sort of slightly uh, uh, um, pulling my leg about my inability to pronounce certain certain Irish names or just answer asking questions in a sort of very um, open manner. It, what he was trying to do at all stages was relax you, and that was um, wonderful. Uh, one other thing I'd just like to mention is um, about Northern Ireland. Um, my first experience, I think, of Lord Kerr was appearing in a case called Adams, which is about miscarriages of justice. And uh, that had an English element, but also a Northern Irish element. And the Northern Irish cases were ones that had risen from the troubles and they were quite bad miscarriages of justice, to be frank. And they were brought by people who um, were clearly uh, lacking in faith in the justice system because they'd been let down. And Lord Kerr, from 
sort of the first moment made it clear to the to everybody, including those parties, how he understood that the, 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 the way in which they'd been treated and the way in which they'd been wronged, those individuals, and uh, gave them faith in, in, in the system. And as an outsider in Northern Ireland, and there are uh, Northern Irish uh, uh, people here, uh, actually, I don't really regard myself as an outsider in Northern Ireland. I think I'm an insider in Northern Ireland. But, uh, um, but as now <laughs> someone who uh, has only come to Northern Ireland uh, relatively recently, what has struck me is that there are a lot of people who... Uh, for understandable reasons, lack faith in the justice system. And Lord Kerr's willingness to stand up to injustice and challenge uh, the authorities in appropriate circumstances uh, meant that he was one of the people who gave faith to people who'd lost faith in the justice system. And I hope that, in one sense, is one of uh, an important part of his legacy. But going back to my personal thing, uh, sort of position, I'm going to miss seeing Lord Kerr at Heathrow, seeing him at Belfast City Airport, seeing him in Belfast. Um, he he was um, such a wonderful, warm judge. I think we we've lost someone very special. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, we turn next to Sonali Knight QC. She's a barrister at Garden Court Chambers and specialises in public law and in all aspects of immigration, asylum, and nationality law. She's the chair of Liberty and a trustee of Freedom From Torture and the Immigration's Aid Trust, Sonali. Thanks very much. Um, one thing I discovered about reading about Lord Kerr was that as a schoolboy, he had ambitions to attend Oxford University, but was never entered for the exam, apparently because his school felt that it was a slightly ridiculous aspiration. I like that story because he later then introduced himself as the only Supreme Court judge who hadn't gone to Oxbridge. Uh, and then corrected that to uh, the joke of I'm the only justice who had the great good fortune to be educated at Queen's University Belfast. So I quite like that the example of diversity in the Supreme Court is that you're the only judge who hasn't been to Oxbridge, but that can only be a good thing, uh, I think. So I, I'd like to repeat that anecdote. I also had a very great uh, fortune to appear in front of Lord Kerr. My first appearance on the Supreme Court on my feet I was being led by the late Ian Macdonald QC on the way to the court on day two in the taxi. My leader said to me, well, I think you should do the reply, Sonali. So no, no advance notice, although I will put my hands up and say I had written it. Um, but he introduced me to Lord Kerr in court in front of the whole panel. My junior has just taken silk. Uh, and so I've asked her to do the reply. And Lord Kerr said, well, congratulations. <laughs> and I thought, again, I think he might have suspected what was going on there and put me at my ease. And that was incredibly nice and incredibly relaxing. And I was surprised by uh, that my nerves didn't get the better of me. Um, and so that was just a sort of personal and experience. But in the context of the, the case we were doing was K Nigeria. And one of the things, obviously, that marks out Lord Kerr's judgments uh, was his willingness to stand up in the most difficult cases, which are, uh, well, the ones certainly from my practice in relation to immigration and criminal deportation, to be brave in dissent, see Hesham Ali and I think Raza Hussein may be talking about that later, um, and, and just to get to the heart of the case and focus on what was really important, which in this context was particularly about children's rights. And there are a couple of cases I just wanted to mention about uh, about children's rights, which, you know, he, he, along with Baroness Hale, gave the seminal judgments in ZH Tanzania, emphasising the importance of, I mean, it's, it's perhaps old hat to us now, but it wasn't then about the primary, that children's rights and best interests should be primary consideration. And that he, in ZH, his, his um, comment that it will require considerations of su substantial moment to permit a different result was quite groundbreaking, particularly against the background of the facts in that case, um, which was a, a sort of poor, what might be described in polite terms as a poor immigration history of the mother. And he also emphasised as well in relation to the nationality of children, that if a child is a British citizen that has an independent value, freestanding, and it must weigh in the balance 
and that the benefits that British citizenship bring children should not be readily, must not be readily discounted. And those set the scene, those remarks set the scene then for the cases that came after, including HH, the extradition case. And again, he emphasised there that even so, even where we're dealing with extradition, that it wasn't um, the intrinsic value of the Article 8 right wasn't altered. Um, it would just be more readily defeasible in the extradition context. But he again emphasised the importance of identifying what is the right, the identifying the legitimate aim and then determining whether the interference in pursuit of that aim was legitimate um, and so and proportionate. And so that was a, was a, a, a theme, of course, of his other judgments in this field in particular and they were cited with approval in Zumbas but I mean, he obviously sat in that court but Lord Hodge gave the judgment of the court and Lord Wilson again emphasized uh, specifically Lord Kerr's approach uh, in relation to the structured approach to Article 8 and the structured approach in relation to children's interests um, uh, and that's th he's been cited with approval on so many occasions and they can see that the authority that the that are in relation to children that um, that he had there. And the final case I just wanted to mention before talking about KO was the case of McClouf, which in which he gave the leading judgment along with Baroness Hales. Um, and this was the that case laid the foundations really in principle for the proper approach to be taken in children's rights cases in deportation. And what was most frustrating, you can read that in his judgment, was that the facts didn't support it. And that's always a real frustration to all lawyers that you've got a great, great legal principle and, and facts that don't don't help. But he did set out that separate consideration of best interests is, re is required in where the children's interests don't converge with those of the parent to be deported. And that is a concept we're still um, obviously working on and, and um, which was in some senses reinforced in uh, KO Nigeria again, although the outcome on the facts might have been disappointing. So all I would say just in summary was that I had the great pleasure to be at the, the Air Centre's 70th anniversary lecture that Lord Kerr gave and um, it was a pleasure to hear him and we learned so much. I watched, I could watch that now that all those seminars are on YouTube and recorded because of the lockdown. It's actually really insightful to watch them again and have the opportunity to watch them again and that is it's one tiny benefit of having been in the lockdown the zoom zoominar webinars or whatever we're calling them um but what he emphasized there in that uh in that conference speech was something he he focused on in Heshamali make sure that you get the court to identify the legitimate aim in that case, it was the prevention of crime. And it's only in that context that you can then assess necessity and proportionality. And it's such an important lesson, a simple one, but a very important lesson, particularly for those who practice in my area of work. So I'm extremely grateful and um, uh, honoured to have heard that. Thank you. Gosh, thank you so much, Sonali. It's a true insight. Um, next, we have Durham Mackin, and he's a partner and the head of public law at Phoenix Law in Belfast. He's developed a specialist practice in human rights, public law, actions against the police, uh, public authorities and international law. So over to you, Dara, please. Thank you, Sweeney, and thank you to the, the Human Rights uh, Lawyers Association for inviting me um, to speak tonight. I have to say uh, I feel wholly inadequate, um, having been uh, dwarfed certainly by the professional and personal experiences of um, my colleagues, um, however, uh, I'm extremely humbled to be asked to contribute uh, in a very small way. Um, I have to say my connection with the word cure originates um, from the very point uh, that Sonali just touched upon, uh, which is uh, the, the experience that we shared uh, having originated from the same school. Um, both, uh, we were both educated, obviously, at um, St. Coman's College, which is a, to give kind of context, uh, this is a school in a, a small uh, town called Newry, which is about halfway between Belfast and Dublin. And uh, certainly uh, in my experience, similar to uh, Lord Kerr's uh, at Oxford and the, the ridiculous aspiration, I have to say it wasn't until uh, much, much later after school that I realized that Oxford wasn't just a type of shoe. Um, so having come from a small uh, school in a border town, I have to say that 
uh, I personally had a, a self-imposed uh, glass ceiling, a self-imposed chip in my shoulder. Um, little did I know that um, later in my career, uh, a man who originated from the very same corridors and the very same, uh, being educated in the very same school would be uh, single-handedly responsible for removing that uh, chip on my shoulder. Um, to me, um, about, about, to me, Lord Kerr uh, was a true inspiration for a number of reasons, particularly uh, his inspirational combination uh, of intellectual prowess was only matched uh, by his personal and heart, heartfelt manner in which he delivered his rulings. He never forgot the victims and those who were at the center of the process. Victims were always the center of every uh, judgment. Uh, and certainly in my first experience and before the Supreme Court, uh, represent, playing a very small part, uh, representing an intervener in the case of KU. Uh, despite uh, a very difficult factual backdrop, I will never forget um, Lord Kerr's uh, ruling, which to me is symbolic as to what the law is all about. The paragraph 285, he said, with regret, re sorry, with regret, I've concluded that the appeal cannot succeed. This is an instance where the law has proved itself unable to respond positively to the demand that there be re redress for the historical wrong that the appellants so passionately believe has been per perpetrated on them and their relatives. That may reflect a deficiency in our system of law. It certainly does not represent any discredit on the honorable crusade that the appellants have pursued. To me, that paragraph will always resonate, not just as having been my first experience in the Supreme Court uh, with Lord Kerr, but it was indicative of how he handled some of the most uh, important and emotionally supercharged legal challenges uh, in history. The theme forever run through his judgments, it was not without note that the victims would never be forgotten. Again, uh, uh, one of the most seminal cases to arise from this jurisdiction in the case of uh, Pat Finucane and the murder of a solicitor. Uh, he opened, it's not without note that he opened the judgment by paying tri tribute to the relentless campaign by Mrs. Finucane and her children for justice. But personally for me, the one case that I will never forget, and I will always remember uh, for the exact sentiments that um, Dana Rose has already touched upon, is the case of NIHRC. Uh, he paid specific tribute, uh, as Dana has touched upon, to the bravery and the courage to which he described as whole, wholly admirable to the women who came forward to give uh, their accounts and to give their evidence. I have to say, um, I haven't had the privilege of representing those uh, women. Um, the NHARC case, and in particular, um, Lord Kerr's uh, comments will forever be a beacon to me, and not just to me, but to, the, to all those individuals and to those victims who show courage in coming forward uh, in very, very difficult uh, circumstances. I have to say that I, I read with them, um, great fondness that uh, on his retirement, Lord Chair was quoted as saying that this case was one of the most significant of his career. It is regrettable and albeit too late, um, but I think it is worth paying testament to the fact that those very words that he uttered in that very judgment uh, was not just uh, pivotal, but indeed significant for the very women at the very heart of the process. As many may know, uh, one of those women went on to take further litigation and it is not without any uh, shadow of a doubt that Lord Kerr's comments were in particular uh, pivotal to giving them the courage that was needed, to giving them the courage to remove the glass ceiling for advocating and fighting for women's rights, even after a very, very difficult uh, battle in the, in, in the Supreme Court, in which unfortunately, similar to the theme in KU, whilst the victim's uh, role in the judgment was significant, the ruling uh, unfortunately could not um, go uh, far enough. These experiences uh, are albeit a, a, a small drop in the ocean uh, of Lord Kerr's legacy, but they do have throughout a theme that he single-handedly inspired and provide inspiration, not just for us uh, lawyers, but for clients alike. Uh, his legacy will live on. For my part, uh, he will remain uh, an incredible inspiration who single-handedly demonstrated that there are no glass ceilings. Uh, having come from a, a very small school in a, in a small border town, I often felt that in order to be the best lawyer, I needed to be a city lawyer. I needed to be in Belfast. And when I got to Belfast, I often found that the chip on my shoulder was that I needed to be in London. To be the best lawyer, I needed to be in London. And I found out very quickly that when I got to London, the very best lawyer was in fact originating from the very same school in the very small same border town. So, so dare I finish by saying that maybe the, the chip on the shoulder should be with the London lawyers for those lawyers who come from Ireland. Uh, I, I say that in jest, but I should say that um, the jest should not in any way reflect of the privilege that I am very lucky to have experienced in uh, having appeared before uh, Lord Kerr, because to me, 
and to many uh, colleagues and peers, he is an example in real life of the removing of the glass ceiling. His judgments, dissent and humanity will forever remain an inspiration, not just for me, but for the next generation of lawyers. And I'm truly privileged to be uh, asked to speak tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dara. My gosh, that must have been some school on a small border town to produce two such lawyers. Uh, next, we have uh, Karen Monaghan QC. She practices at Matrix Chambers and is a visiting professor at the University College London, and her principal fields of practice are in equality and human rights law. Over to you, Karen. Thank you very much, Aswini. One of the terrible things about this pandemic is we can't be together in person um, to celebrate Lord Kerr, Brian, as he would insist we'd called him, I'm sure. Um, but I'm really pleased to have had the opportunity to say a few words about him. As others have said, he was a very, very warm man, very empathetic and very funny. All of those characteristics were evident in court, but outside of court, he was very, very funny, very funny, um, a little irreverent, perhaps. I don't know whether I'm allowed to say that, but certainly that's how I experienced it. Um, personally, he was also very supportive to me. It's apparent from what others have said, Dinah, for example, that he was supportive to lots of other women too. Um, he was a marvellous judge to appear in front of. And as a woman advocate, even as a senior woman advocate, his approach um, to engagement with barristers, it seems to me was one that made women in particular feel comfortable. Hugh's already spoken about this, searching questions, but none of the warishness or competitiveness we see in other judges. And as a woman advocate, I always, always felt in front of Lord Kerr that I was listened to. Again, not an experience that I always had, even in senior courts. So he was a great man to appear in front of. He was also somebody, as others have said too, that was on the side of the vulnerable. As a claimant equality and human rights lawyer, you wanted him on the court because you knew he would listen. You knew he would understand and empathize with the experiences of those who were the concerned, um, the clients, those who were affected by the decisions that were gonna have to be made. Um, this was apparent in particular in the welfare benefits cases. We've heard about immigration cases and others. But in the welfare benefits cases, he was somebody who stood up clearly and firmly for the women and children involved, in particular in relation to the brutal benefit cap cases. One case where the court did, concluded that the effect of the benefit cap was to put women and children or some women and children below the poverty line. Um, he was al always on the side of those women and children. That meant he was often a dissenter in two of the main benefit cap cases, and they weren't cases I was involved in, but have read many times and have been struck in particular by his judgments, both cases he dissented in. And in both cases, he made it clear that it was the women and the children that there were focus of his concerns, not government policy on economic savings, austerity, austerity or so socioeconomic planning. He made that clear in particular in DA. I emphasize again, that these are not my cases, but really striking for the empathy that he demonstrated for both the women and children. DA, single parents affected by the benefit cap because they couldn't work the requisite number of hours. He emphasized the degree of scrutiny that a court must undertake where the rights of women and children were engaged. This was not a superficial review, but a rigorous scrutiny if the government's decisions were to be lawful. In relation to another benefit cap cases, and there have been many of these brutal cases, another benefit cap case, SG, made it clear that the impact on women, mothers, was indissociable, as he described it, from the impact on their children. So discriminating against women was to affect necessarily the impact on their children. And both of those matters had to be rigorously scrutinized. 
also made clear that from his perspective, very controversially, um, that the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the primacy it gives to the best interests of children should be treated as directly applicable in such cases, all demonstrating the real concern he had for the vulnerable, as we've already heard about women in particular and children. Uh, and that's that, that concern about women, as I say, extends beyond his role of a judge, but into all those areas where he might have had, had an impact, relationship with women barristers in court, supporting women in the law outside of court. He was a very much loved judge, and that's an unusual thing to say about a judge. We might say they're professionally competent, they're extraordinarily clever, they made a great contribution to the jurisprudence in this area, but very few judges would have so many barristers saying how loved he was. And he was a very loved judge. Like many others, I was incredibly shocked when I heard about his death. Um, and he will be very, very much missed by me and I know by others who are speaking tonight and very many others uh, who will be watching and listening in. Thank you so much, Karen, that's very moving. Um, we'd like to turn to our next contributor who's uh, Raza Hussein QC. And he's also a barrister at Matrix Chambers and specializes in public law with an emphasis on immigration and human rights. Um, Raza. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sweeney. Um, I agree with everything that everybody has said up to now. It's a deep honor for me to be invited to give my tribute to the late, great Lord Kerr. Uh, thank you to the HRLA and to Shoaib for organizing the event. Um, it was one of the privileges of my career to, a before, to appear before Lord Kerr in the Supreme Court. I was lucky enough to do so on a number of occasions in appeals raising a wide range of issues. Uh, Lord Kerr always displayed total mastery of the case in all of them. I think as Tom Hickman has said, he always cut to the chase and got to the heart of the issue, always with utmost politeness and the impish humor with whom people have spoken, about whom people have spoken. I approached uh, appearing before him with a mixture of hope and trepidation, hope that he'd find for me, trepidation that I would do the case justice and him justice, if that makes any sense. I first appeared in front of him, just wanna share uh, one memory, uh, in the case of um, Kambadzi. This was a false imprisonment claim in one of his early cases in February, 2010. Uh, he made quite an impression as Tom Hickman may remember. Uh, the issue was whether a failure to conduct reviews of the continuing need for executive detention meant that the initial authority to detain was deprived of legal effect. The Secretary of State's argument that it did not was accepted by the Court of Appeal. Lord Kerr crystallised the issue with a concision and insight which were to become his hallmark on the court. Does authority exhaust legality, he asked. Then there was a Paxman Howard moment too. He put government counsel on the spot with his usual politeness and wouldn't leave his questioning until he had his answer. He must have asked exactly the same question concerning the relationship between public law error and the tort about five times. His judgment in that case and also in Lumba is highly nuanced and his analysis deeply penetrating. Uh, paragraphs 244 to 246, for those interested in Lumba, I think are the answer to the entire case. On a similar note, I think his judgment in EM Eritrea, a case about the EU Dublin regulation, is the best thing ever written by a judge on the Dublin regulation. And his dissent in Hashemali is the best thing ever written by a judge in any jurisdiction on Article 8 in the context of deportation. More generally, he made a huge contribution to public law, both in his judgments and lectures on proportionality in KU, on legitimate expectation in Finucane, about which Dara has spoken, on the margin of appreciation in Steinfield, on the limits of the mirror principle 
in Ambrose, uh, to which as we referred, and on closed material procedures in Tarek, uh, one of his great, great descents. Um, I, I read an interview with Justice in 2014 that the judges who inspired him the most included Lord Bingham and Lord Stain. He, well, he was very much an inspiration to me and I know to many legions of others. He was very much in the tradition of Lords Bingham and Stain, a judge of huge intellect and colossal humanity, morality and courage. One of the, if not the great, human rights judges of modern times. It was a deep privilege for me to have met him and corresponded with him outside court. He was wonderfully kind, ridiculously humble and always supportive. That it seems is, was also very much the view of his colleagues on the Supreme Court. Lady Arden in the men cap Tomlinson Blake case, uh, the judgment in which was given last Friday said this, I wish to pay the fullest tribute to the late Lord Kerr, who passed away in December 2020. He was a justice of this court for over 10 years. He presided over these appeals at the hearing, demonstrating his live, in his lively exchanges with counsel, his intellectual leadership, commitment to the cause of justice, warmth, warmth of personality, empathy, enormous courtesy, and deep humanity. His passing is a great loss to this court and to many, that's Lady Arden. Uh, I think many of us uh, continue to experience his loss as shocking and devastating. As Dinah said, uh, we loved him. I certainly did. Uh, we mourn his passing and miss him enormously. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raza. That was very moving. Um, and I'd like to turn now to Keelan Gallagher QC, he's my colleague at Doughty Street Chambers, who specialises in human rights and civil liberties. Um, she's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and her contribution to human rights. And she's been named, I'm going to mention this, as one of the 100 most influential women, Irish women living outside of Ireland in 2016. So over to you, Ke Keelan. Thank you very much, Aswini. Um, and what a privilege to be speaking at this event and huge thanks to the Human Rights Lawyers Association for organising it. Um, Lord Kerr or Brian, as he always insisted we call him uh, once we were outside the courtroom setting, and I suspect he would have quite liked us to call him that even within a courtroom setting, uh, if he could, was someone all of us who are gathered here today respected and admired greatly, uh, above all for his wisdom, his intellect, his kindness and his gentle wit. And for many of us who are gathered here today, I know that there's a tremendous sense of private as well as public bereavement. Many of us like you will have sobbed when we heard the news um, at the end of last year, so sudden, far, far too soon. Many of us like Dinah will consider his loss unbearable. Uh, one of the first words I had written down to use and Dinah I think spoke for so many of us when she used it at the outset of the event this, this evening. So just at the outset, I, I join Aswini and the other speakers in extending my deepest sympathies to his family and thank you for joining us today. And in my view, the UK, Northern Ireland, and indeed the island of Ireland, which I say not politically, but very conscious that Lord Kerr was a member and then an honorary venture of the King's Inns uh, in Dublin, uh, my original inn, have lost an extraordinary and a diverse legal scholar and a wonderful, warm, generous and kind man. There's a number of things I want to touch on, uh, echoing in some respects what others have said. Firstly, I, I thought it was right that we reflect the sheer breadth of his expertise. And Brian was a true polymath in legal terms. And often those of us, particularly at the public law bar with expertise in children's rights or in international human rights, think of him in those terms. Uh, but in fact, um, he was of course the commercial judge for Northern Ireland in the 1990s. Uh, he was the Lord Chief Justice at a tremendously challenging time in Northern Ireland, only the second Catholic to hold that top post in Northern Ireland. And if you look at the range of cases in the Supreme Court in his 11 years in which he gave lead judgments, you get a sense of um, his polymath background. So, for example, just to give a few of the groundbreaking important judgments in which he gave the leading or joint leading judgment, that includes things like Montgomery and Lancashire Health Board joint judgment with Lord Reid, dealing with the requirement of informed consent for medical procedures, 
uh, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission case, which Dinah and Dara have referred to uh, earlier, um, one of the very few cases uh, in which we had a very large number, in fact, a majority of women silks um, as advocates in that case. Uh, and that, of course, dealt with the compatibility of the law on abortion in Northern Ireland with Article 8 of the European Convention. And he also dealt with Article 3 uh, masterfully in his judgment. There's the Steinfeld judgment, the availability of civil partnerships uh, to couples of different genders, case in which Karen acted. The Stalker and Stalker, a groundbreaking case in defamation law, dealing with the use of dictionary, defama dictionary definitions and defamation actions, which is also a hugely important case in women's rights terms, but a very, very different context. And there's El Ghazuli and the Secretary of State for the Home Department, dealing with the development of the common law, the application of the Data Protection Act, the transfer of material to the USA, which might have facilitated the imposition of the death penalty. And I say that just because it gives a flavor of the very wide range of cases in which he gave lead judgments in these groundbreaking areas. He was also, of course, chairman of the Mental Health Commission in Northern Ireland, president of the Expert Witness Institute. It's difficult to think of an honor which passed him by uh, when you actually look at his breathtakingly broad uh, CV. So I think it's very important that we remember that. Um, second, I did want to pick up on a key issue relating to the importance of many of his dissents, having just referred to a number of his leading judgments in which he gave the judgment of the court. Um, he was never afraid to be a lone voice if he thought it right. And uh, I'm minded when I look at some of his dissents to think of the very powerful words of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, another um, a colossus of a judge who we lost in the last year, the Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, who said, speaking extrajudicially, dissents speak to a future age. It's not simply to say my colleagues are wrong and I would do it this way, but the greatest dissents do become court opinions and gradually over time, their views become the dominant view. So that's the dissenters hope that they're writing not for today, but for tomorrow. Now, Karen referred earlier to the benefits cases, including the SG case, and I acted for uh, the um, lone mothers and the children in that series of cases, at SG and for some of the uh, appellants in the DA case. And if you look at his judgment in the SG case, he says uh, in the judgment um, that because he has formed his view, on one view, there's nothing to be gained from me contributing any further to the debate. And he then goes through 30, pa 30 paragraphs of masterful analysis on why, in his view, Article 3 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child should have direct effect. And many of us who are working in the field of children's rights and do hold the hope that that may be an example of him speaking to a future age and that this was a groundbreaking judgment on children's rights, which is a view that's gaining traction amongst others. Uh, but this is a judgment which he gave in 2015 at a time when uh, that was um, him putting his head above the parapet in a way. So I do want to highlight uh, his lone voice in many of his dissenting judgments and hope that he'll be proved right in the fullness of time. And children's rights in particular, Sonali referred to this earlier, is an area of uh, tremendous importance to Lord Kerr. And we were very lucky to have Lord Kerr uh, when we launched the children's rights group at Doughty Street Chambers a number of years ago uh, to come and to um, open our inaugural annual lecture where uh, Professor Geraldine Van Buren QC gave uh, an incredible lecture about children's rights, uh, which Lord Kerr described as inspiring, enlightening, sometimes depressing. But at that event, uh, he highlighted the importance of having a child rights focus. And he spoke about uh, the importance of reminding ourselves of the need to invest in our children as the future inheritors of our planet. And on many occasions over the last number of years, I've spoken to him outside court about children's rights issues. And that was an issue which was hugely close to his heart and it uh, sings out through his judgments. The third thing I wanted to mention uh, is related to uh, his modesty. Some people have referred earlier to how modest he was. And there's actually a very powerful example of that, um, which Gregory Jones QC from Francis Taylor Buildings um, has used. I, I thought it was sensible to uh, refer to this. I'm very conscious that indeed Brian had intended he returned to practice of Francis Taylor buildings. And I think as well as what we've lost in him as a judge, we've also lost um, out on what he would have done uh, on his return to practice um, at that time. But Gregory Jones, QC, one of his colleagues uh, at Francis Taylor buildings uh, tells a wonderful story, which I think will resonate with many uh, of you in the virtual room today. 
uh, which is that he was a judge of their Kingsland mooting competition. He judged it on multiple occasions, held it number one court in the Old Bailey. On one occasion, there'd been a security alert in the city of London, as Sir Brian had to rush over from the Supreme Court uh, to the Old Bailey. And in fact, he was barred entry by security staff. He produced his Supreme Court identity card, which did not work uh, with the Old Bailey security. Uh, and their response was, Supreme Court, sir, never heard of it. Uh, but despite that, uh, Lord Kerr uh, actually quite enjoyed, as I understand it, being considered a possible security threat, never once said, look, do you know who I am? And one of my warmest memories of him is very similar to that, uh, which is um, that after a series of cases concerning abortion rights, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission case, which you heard about earlier, and also the A and B case, which I know Angela Jackman will be talking about uh, shortly, um, which related to our client, Angela and I acted together in that case, um, related to our client who was a teenage girl uh, who was pregnant in Northern Ireland from a low income family and was unable to access an abortion at an early stage in her pregnancy when she wanted to have an abortion at around the six week mark, simply for socioeconomic reasons. And she was unable to travel without raising funds. And when she traveled to another part of the UK, uh, she did not have an entitlement to free termination services on the NHS simply because she was from Northern Ireland rather than from a different constituent part of the UK. And Lord Kerr had given um, very powerful judgment in that case also. And there was an event which was organized by students in Cambridge um, after that series of cases on abortion rights in a changing Europe. And it was a wonderful event. Um, myself and Natalie Leaven, now High Court judge, were uh, on a panel chaired by Lord Kerr. And uh, there was a wonderful event afterwards at which, uh, unfortunately, um, Lord Kerr got locked in a room on one occasion uh, for a period of time. And he was missing in action uh, for a short period of time, about 20 minutes. Um, and when he was eventually discovered, the students who'd organized the event uh, were very worried um, about the event having been ruined and were very worried about the impact on Lord Kerr. And his first response when he came over uh, to the dinner where he was sitting with myself and Natalie, well, his first response was, I need a drink. Uh, but his second response uh, was to be extremely concerned about the students and to put them at their ease and to ensure that they were not worried um, about the impact uh, of this unfortunate incident on their event. Uh, he was extremely concerned to make sure that they realized that the event had been a success. This was a minor blip and he wanted to downplay the importance of it. Uh, and also, uh, he was very keen, even though it was extremely late and a real dash for the train, uh, to make sure that anyone who wanted to speak to him, no matter how junior they were, no matter what stage of undergraduate degree they were at, if they wanted to speak to him, uh, he made sure that his door was open and he was available to speak to them. And he did that all evening. And that really typifies him. It fits so much with what Dinah said uh, earlier too. Um, another uh, event at which uh, I spoke with him concerned Northern Ireland and Brexit. And uh, I did want to just tell you this quote uh, because um, it's a quote which is very dear to my heart. And um, Brian has told me that it, it was a quote very dear to his heart too. I spend every August in Donegal with family and I often go to a tiny bridge outside Falcara called the Bridge of Tears, Drihid Nanyor. And it's where in the 19th and 20th centuries, local families would walk with their loved ones who were leaving home to escape famine and terrible poverty to seek a better life in America or Canada. And in those days when you left Ireland or Northern Ireland to travel, uh, the chances of you ever seeing your family again uh, were almost non-existent as the journey was so long, arduous and expensive. And there was the knowledge that many who took that journey as emigrants never made it, dying instead of sickness and disease on the ships transporting them. So the parting there was final. There would have been many tears shed. And what it says on that bridge is, but on shot on scara shod drohad nanyor. Here is the separation. This is the bridge of tears. And in fact, now, of course, separation is not so absolute, although it may feel like it in COVID times. And many people have traveled from Northern Ireland and work here, but ensure that their work also resonates back in Northern Ireland. And I've had many discussions about that over the years, and I know he would have been hugely, um, hugely uh, honored to hear what Dara said earlier. And, but finally for me, um, I'm sure many of you have seen a wonderful uh, piece that Owen Bocott wrote about Lord Kerr um, in October last year, uh, shortly after Lord Kerr's retirement. And the paragraph at the end of that 
piece uh, really resonates with me and I wanted to share it with you this evening. It, it ends by saying, having now stood down from the Supreme Court, and Lord Kerr will do arbitration and mediation work. Unlike many of his senior judicial colleagues, he's a peer because he was a member of the House of Lords, parliamentary House of Lords. And the quote is this, when this dystopian nightmare of COVID-19 ends, I might go back into the House of Lords to make a bit of mischief, he said. None of the other Supreme Court justices have translated to the upper house, which I think is regrettable. Many would give very useful contributions. And I think we have been robbed of a wonderful man, a wonderful jurist, uh, someone who meant a lot to many of us. We've been robbed of his opportunity to make mischief in the House of Lords uh, because of Lord Kerr, the worlds of his childhood in Northern Ireland uh, and the worlds of his uh, university days in Northern Ireland have been greatly enriched. The island of Ireland has been greatly enriched and the law in the UK has been greatly enriched. And to use the words of Seamus Heaney, another Northern Irish man who I greatly admire, uh, and afterwards, rust, thistles, silence, sky. Thank you. Gosh, Kian, thank you. Some lovely quotes. And I might just share this, that I, Bryce Dixon at Queen's University Belfast has counted 283 judgments of which 112 were written dissents which um, I think is we must remember and support as part of Lord Kerr's legacy, as you have suggested. So I'm going to turn to uh, Ronan Lavery QC uh, from Belfast. He practices mainly at the Northern Ireland Bar, uh, um, but also works uh, at the Bar in Dublin and at the International Criminal Court, specialises in human and uh, civil rights and constitutional law, and appeared in the Brexit prorogation cases. Uh, Ronan. Uh, thank you very much, Oswini. Um, it looks as if the Irish are taking over here. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm very honoured to take part here, very honoured to be asked to take part. Um, and um, I'm here because I want to share my own personal experiences of Lord Kerr, Brian Kerr, um, who was a close family friend of ours. I knew him from a very early age. Um, we're back to Donegal here as well, um, where he, he and my father had holiday homes beside each other um, near the airport and beach at Carrick Finn. Um, and in fact, uh, they, were, they were very close and he delivered the eulogy at my father's funeral two years ago. Um, and the way he spoke said so much about him as a person about his understanding of my father's eccentric ways. My father was at the bar for 61 years um, and uh, they spent many summers, many blissful summers together um, in Donegal. And I remember that uh, myself. And I remember as a child um, serving drinks to Brian, to uh, Uncle Jim, to, uh, and I remember as a child his uh, patience um, and certainly didn't complain when we got the measures wrong uh, when I was uh, doing barman. But I also remember um, my mother used to say that you can tell an awful lot by a person and by the way they interact with dogs and children. But I, I don't know about his... Um, interaction with dogs, but I remember as a child uh, how he stood out um, as, and this wasn't that common, he stood out because he did take a genuine interest in children. He took a genuine interest in us, um, which wasn't common among the regulars at the barbecues. Um, he listened to us um, and uh, you may well think that um, that wasn't common. Um, and you may well think that that uh, reflected itself in, in future judgments. He, when he came to the bar in Northern Ireland, uh, he ended up as um, chairman of the bar at one stage and proposed a motion, which again was ahead of his time, um, voting, uh, proposing the removal of wigs and gowns. And we've heard about um, his... Uh, uh, how he disliked formality. But he was also a very good listener because by the end of the debate, 
he ended up voting against his own motion. Um, such was the, such were the arguments made uh, for the retention of wigs and gowns. I'm not sure if the debate uh, would have gone the same way now. I then, uh, whenever I came to the bar in the 1990s, appeared before him when he was our first uh, specially designated judicial review judge. Uh, and again, I remember his patience and how encouraging he was to young members of the bar, me included, but all of our colleagues uh, would agree with this, um, that he would be very encouraging, patient, and the qualities that the rest of you um, saw uh, from him in the Supreme Court, he displayed at an early age, but he was always encouraging people to take new and interesting points um, in a fun way. And I think that's what's coming across here tonight as well. Um, he enjoyed the exchanges, the playfulness of it, and, and the fun. Uh, he wasn't afraid to expose his mind. Um, he certainly cut through arguments um, and counsel as well, if necessary. Um, he, and Keelan alluded to this as well, um, I had thought that he was the first, what I'd like to call non-unionist, Lord Chief Justice uh, in 2004. Uh, it was clear that uh, the unionist protectionism um, was no match for his phenomenal intellect and, of course, his charm. Um, he, he wouldn't have defined himself in that way um, as a non-unionist or Catholic. Uh, he represented the Northern Ireland Bar, which transcended those labels um, and still does. Uh, when he was appointed to the Supreme Court in 2009, um, he was, um, as I say, he, as a non-unionist, if I can call him that, uh, from Northern Ireland, he understood ethnicity. He understood being part of a minority. And we know from what I said before that he understood children. He understood the vulnerable. Um, and this, of course, was reflected in his judgments. Um, in the Supreme Court, it was always nice to see a familiar face whenever I was over and appeared before him. That didn't mean I got an easy time. And it didn't mean that it was a, a that he was it was a familiar face, not always friendly uh, to the arguments uh, that were presented. Which again, in a fun way, uh, he uh, challenged, uh, and uh, we, we we debated. Um, the two Brexit cases. I remember uh, in the, a lull in what was otherwise a dramatic uh, or, or dramatic proceedings in the first Brexit case. Uh, I'll call it a low. I, I don't want to be any more specific about the timing of the email, but uh, certainly at a less dramatic point in the proceedings, um, the Northern Ireland, Irish contingent received an email. Uh, uh, do you wish, um, do you uh, want to uh, come and join us uh, for a glass of champagne at the end of the proceedings on Thursday evening. And of course, we all said yes and replied. Um, and we came round to his chambers um, and where the champagne was generously provided. And uh, he was there with um, Lord Newberger, who joined us as well. And he talked about his... Um, uh, that he was entitled to and in fact had an Irish passport. And Lord Newberger uh, offered that from his uh, German Jewish heritage, that he might well be entitled to a German passport. And David Schofield, who is now Mr. Justice Schofield, uh, said that Kieran here, who's from Newry, uh, he, knows a, he knows a boy in Newry who gets you any passport you want. Uh, don't you worry about that. In the, in the second Brexit case, I remember as well that he tried his best to, uh, to stop me from, uh, uh, <laughs> he tried his best 
because uh, he knew that um, Lord Wilson was about to blow a gasket. But I willfully ignored him and uh, proceeded with it uh, despite all of his exhortations. I, I was privileged to know Brian Kerr, uh, Lord Kerr. Um, he saw they talked about names and getting them wrong, the Irish names. We knew him as Kerr, not Kerr. And one time uh, in the, uh, the hearing in the Supreme Court, uh, Lady Hale um, referred to me as Mr. Lavery, and he very quickly shot across uh, that it was Lavery, not Lavery. Um, so uh, I, again, the, the friendliness of the face and the famil familiarity. But in the time of COVID, um, what, what I regret is not being able to meet with uh, Gillian and John and Patrick and share as we normally would these stories and our recollections and to properly uh, be with each other and, and extend our condolences in a real and physical way. And I'm sorry I can't do that. I'm just glad that they're here and listening tonight. Um, I spent the day today uh, arguing a case in the Court of Appeal in Belfast uh, against his niece, Nessa Murnahan. Um, and I think she's joined us here tonight as well. And she, um, of course, uh, has, uh, through her family line, inherited um, very much his intellect and charm. And she'll be pleased to hear me say that, I'm sure. But as I say, it's a tremendous loss for the legal profession. Uh, he was a true ambassador for Northern Ireland in, in the Supreme Court, and he was everything that is good about this place. The, the voices that are very often not heard from Northern Ireland, voices of um, progression, intellect, and uh, um, his charm and playfulness. And we'll all miss that dearly. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Ronan. That's very, very lovely. So I'd like to turn to Angela Jackman QC next, who's a public law solicitor and partner at Simpson Miller. Um, she's also a consultant and senior lecturer at the City Law School and a fellow of the Higher Education Academy and a member of the Society of Human Rights Committee, um, Law Society Human Rights Committee and, and of um, a, an expert panel member of the Strategic Legal Fund for Vulnerable Young Migrants. So, um, Angela, please. Thank you very much, Tasmini, and also to the Human Rights uh, Lawyers Association for inviting me. I do feel incredibly humbled. I didn't have the privilege and joy of knowing Lord Kerr. It's fascinating to hear so many testimonies and personal accounts of him. So I'd like to make a small contribution to demonstrate the impact of some of his judgments on lawyers who didn't know him and also upon others. So I'm just going to briefly touch upon the A and B case that Keelan has already mentioned as we work together to support incredibly tenacious clients from Northern Ireland, A and B. And I thought I'd also just share a few words from an academic's point of view in relation to particularly the case of Nick Linson, because there's lots of debates happening at the moment with students in the context of the review of the Human Rights Act. So in terms of A and B, they were clients of uh, Keelan and, and myself for seven years. It was a very, very long, uh, protracted uh, challenge, and I have huge respect for them for the courage that they showed in raising their head above the parapet to challenge the then unlawful, in our view, unlawful policy of the Secretary of State for Health of England, which prohibited women from Northern Ireland accessing abortion services on the NHS. So we issued proceedings in January 2013, and judgment was finally handed down in the Supreme Court on 14th of June 2017. We lost by the narrowest of margins, which was obviously very devastating for the clients. But the point I want to make is that they were incredibly struck and comforted by the empathy, the humanity, 
and power of the lead dissenting judgment of Lord Kerr. I've listened to other colleagues on the panel use words such as empathy and caring and power. And I can say, you know, truly from my heart that the judgment had a huge impact on the clients. And I just wanted to just say, highlight a few words from the judgment that particularly helped them through this quite difficult time. Quote, a woman from Northern Ireland visiting England who suffers an acute attack of appendicitis will have, if it proves necessary, her appendix removed in the National Health Service Hospital without charge. The same woman, if she travels to England in order to obtain an abortion, must pay for that procedure. How can this be right? The answer is that it cannot be and is not right, which they felt really vindicated um, the determination that they had demonstrated in pursuing the, these proceedings. He also went on to say, of course, the woman who travels to England to obtain an abortion has, in a clear majority of cases, no true choice. She must travel away from her home and the support of her family and friends to obtain treatment at the most traumatic type in unfamiliar surroundings. If she wishes to obtain an abortion, she must travel to England. Clearly the situation has improved to some extent now in Northern Ireland, but that wasn't the situation when we brought the litigation. A and B took a huge amount of comfort from these words, especially as A had been through this terribly traumatic experience at the very tender age of 15. I can say that they felt spurred on to keep the challenge up and to instruct their legal team to proceed with a subsequent successful application to the European Court of Human Rights. And I think many of those words in the dissenting judgments of Lord Kerr played a big part in their ongoing determination. And then very briefly, because I'm conscious of the time, I thought I'd just touch on Nick Clinton. Um, it's both an intellectually stimulating, worrying time for us um, as academics and practitioners teaching human rights and practicing human rights because we currently have the Human Rights Act under review. In the context of only 43 declarations having been issued during the 20 year lifespan of the Human Rights Act, there's lots of interesting debates taking place at the moment with students and practitioners on the extent to which the judiciary is sufficiently robust in its use of issuing section four declarations, obviously as a last resort. This has led me to highlight some cases, including Nick Linson, and really focusing on the position taken by Lord Kerr. In that case, assisted suicide, the judiciary found that the legislation in question was clearly incompatible, but it was interesting that there was a debate between them and differences of opinion as to whether or not they should go on to issue a non-binding Section 4 declaration. Quoting from Lord Kerr, this court has the constitutional authority to issue a declaration of incompatibility. In agreement with Lady Hale, I consider that there is no reason that we should refrain from doing so. So concise, powerful, to the point. And I would say that their sentiment is highly topical at present in the debates which are happening around the review. As a member of the Law Society's Human Rights Committee, just this afternoon, a group of us met directly with the panel to make further submissions. And the case of Nick Linson and the different views of the judiciary expressed in that case were raised. I can only hope that the panel will be equally robust as Lord Kerr was in terms of considering the judiciary's constitutional role, both within the rule of law and under the all important Human Rights Act. Thank you. Those were the few words that I wanted to share as a contribution to the impact of two judgments of Lord Kerr. Thank you very much. I think you're muted, Aswini. Oh, oh the, the dreaded mute button. I thought I'd undone it and I was undone. Um, thank you, Angela. I, what I said was those are powerful words and I'm, thank you very much indeed. Um, so I'm going to turn now to Tom Hickman, QC, also a barrister of Blackstone Chambers, specialising in public law, international law, media and sports law, and a professor of public law at the University College of London. Tom, please. Thank you very much. And it is it is an honour uh, to have been asked to participate today. 
um, by the uh, HRLA, um, and I assume that this is because upon Lord Kerr's retirement, I tweeted um, several times about Lord Kerr's incisive uh, interventions, and I remarked that his was the only uh, judicial memoir uh, that I would look forward to reading, although I suspected it was probably the one least likely um, to have been written. Um, my experience of Lord Kerr was as junior counsel, as I expect you know, many people's experience of Lord Kerr will have been, watching and listening um, from the second row. Uh, in my case, in cases stretching back um, to the appellate committee of the House of Lords. So I thought I would say a few words about his judicial interventions in, in the course of um, submissions, and we've heard a little bit about that already um, from others. Um, he was, from where I was sitting, certainly the most courteous and kind of judges, but his interventions, which were always made with a, a grin and occasionally a chuckle, were sugar-coated dynamite. Uh, I was always grateful that it was not me um, that had to respond to them. It always seemed to me that whilst other judges could get bewitched or entangled in the web of apparently highly difficult legal issues spun by leading counsel, Lord Kerr was immune to the dark arts of advocacy. He could see straight through counsel to the real issues that were in play. So with that in mind, I went back and I considered again his interventions in the case of prorogations in the Miller and Cherry case, the second Miller case. Um, it will be recalled, I expect, by everybody here that in that case, the court made clear in its ruling and its remedies, um, not only that Parliament had been unlawfully prorogued, but that it was legally still sitting and Parliament reconvened um, immediately. But it almost wasn't what the courts decided. Lord Keane, in his submissions on behalf of the Prime Minister, tried very hard to ensure that the Supreme Court went no further than granting a declaration that the Prime Minister's advice had been unlawful. On the afternoon of the first day of the hearing, he, he bravely and sincerely offered an undertaking to the court. The Prime Minister, said Lord Keane, will take any necessary steps to comply with the declaration made by this court. Lord Keane held this out as a way of avoiding what he portrayed as the very thorny issue of the court intervening with, in proceedings in Parliament. Whilst other judges seemed attracted by Lord Keane's offer, his get out of jail free card that he offered up to the court, Lord Kerr was having absolutely none of it at all. He smelt a rat. What is the, and I wish I could do his voice, <laughs> I'm not gonna even try. Um, what is the effect of the undertaking, he asked. What happens if this court does declare the prorogation unlawful? Does parliament then reconvene? Lord Keane dodged. It would then be for the prime minister to address the consequences of the declaration, he said. What other consequences, asked Lord Kerr, could there be? Lord Keane weaved. The, the Prime Minister could recall Parliament, he admitted. This answer, I went back and looked at it again this week, was followed by a very long silence. Just long enough for Lord Kerr to ensure that everybody in the court had understood that this meant that Parliament would not be recalled if the court made the declaration that was sought. And the silence was eventually broken by Lord Kerr with the killer rhetorical question, he has other alternatives, you say, does he? And that was the end of the idea of the court granting a declaration. Abiding by a declaration conjures up a number of possibilities, said Lord Kerr, and Lord Kerr was impervious to such conjuring tricks, I thought. 
Um, reflecting on his interventions in that case, and there were others, made me realize that while, as many people have said today, Lord Kerr is often thought of as something of an outlier on the court, as the great dissenter, I actually think that he had a much more central role in cases in which he was in the majority, but often didn't give um, a judgment. I'll just briefly give you another example from the same case to make the point. Um, the big controversial issue in that case was whether the prorogation was justiciable. And the court said in the end that it, it dodged the issue of whether judicial review principles could apply by saying, well, it was uncontroversial that the limits of the power to prorogue um, were policed by parliament and where they rubbed up against a constitutional principle like parliamentary sovereignty, the court could say so. I was therefore, um, I was therefore struck when I went back and I looked at Lord Kerr's interventions because at the beginning of Sir James Eady's submissions on this point, there were a quick fire, almost at the beginning, quick fire series of questions from Lord Kerr, cross-examining the first Treasury Council. Uh, and as with all good cross-examinations, it took the form of a series of questions which appeared to be entirely uncontentious and couldn't possibly be disagreed with. And what Lord Kerr established in those moments was all of the propositions on which the court's supposedly controversial judgment rested. He said, you do accept, Sir James, that it is for the court to decide what the limits on the prerogative power are. My Lord, I do, I do, came the reply. And you must further accept, since after all it was obvious, wasn't it, that the prerogative powers are constrained by overarching fundamental principles. In some circumstances, they are conceded, uh, Sir James Eady. So you accept that there are constraints on the power to prorogue, and it's the purpose and role of the court to consider what those are and whether they've been exceeded. My Lord, I do. Having extracted these concessions, Lord Kerr landed the final blow. He asked whether Sir James Eady accepted that the exercise of power to prorogue Parliament had the potential to affect or undermine the ability of Parliament to hold the government to account. By definition, said First Treasury Council, prorogation has the effects that it has. And there you have, in a nutshell, the reasoning of the court in the second Miller case on the issue of justiceability. Each proposition found in the court's reasoning accepted or as near as damn it accepted uh, by the first treasury council and so I, I did think it was worth making the point that while Lord Kerr is often thought of as the dissenter I think he exercised a quiet and exceptionally skillful influence over the court he was the soul of the court for sure as many people have said today um, but I think he also really was at the heart of some of its jurisprudence and some of the biggest cases that it decided in the long time in which he, uh, he sat uh, on our highest court. Thank you again for letting me say some words today. And I think as every um, junior counsel who has sat through a hearing uh, in which Lord Kerr was sitting, would readily acknowledge his were the interventions that we look forward to the most and that we look back on with the greatest fondness. Thank you. Points very well made. Thank you, Tom. So I'm going to turn next to Margarita Conaglia, and she is a colleague also at Doughty Street Chambers. And she returned to practice in September 2020, following a year spent working as judicial assistant to Lord Kerr, becoming his last judicial assistant. During her time with him, she worked on cases, obviously, of high political sensitivity, including the Miller II pror prorogation case. Um, and while working at the Supreme Court, she was inspired by Lord Kerr's own efforts to promote and strengthen equality. 
uh, Margarita co-founded Themis, the Intersectional Women's Barristers Alliance. Um, Margarita. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for having me tonight. I'm truly honoured to speak in memory of Lord Kerr and alongside such an admirable group of lawyers. I only met Lord Kerr or Brian as he insisted that we judicial assistants call him after leaving the court when I was interviewed at the Supreme Court almost exactly two years ago. My memories of my time with him are therefore few and recent, but definitely indelible. I'd like to use my time to speak about two aspects of Brian's personality, which I think demonstrate in part his commitment and contribution to human rights. The first is his ardent faith in the future of the profession. Brian was the driving force behind the judicial assistant program at the Supreme Court, and I experienced firsthand his uncompromising belief in the potential of young lawyers and in the importance of ensuring diversity amongst them. He was, I would say, one of the strongest advocates for women lawyers at the court. He invested in women JAs, not just by making sure that we were fairly represented in the JA batch, but also by, by valuing our contributions to his work, by creating opportunities for us to meet and work with professionals whom we, ad whom we admired, um, and primarily by persuading us that we were not imposters. Shortly before passing, Brian launched a collaboration between the Supreme Court and Bridging the Bar. And as Sweeney mentioned, he surely inspired Themis. Equality was at the center of his own agenda and largely because of him, so far as possible, at the center of the court's own agenda. I think Brian's progressive spirit, his open-mindedness, was born of his genuine curiosity towards people of all backgrounds and identities and of his deep empathy towards humanity. I often think back to the day when Brian insisted that my parents, who were in London to visit me, come into his office to meet him. It was quite a funny scene. My parents, who speak limited English and would never have imagined to see their daughter within the walls of the UK's Supreme Court, were awestruck when Brian insisted that they sit with him for a glass of champagne and a discussion, half in English and half through my broken translation, on whether the right to religious freedom should be given the same weight as other human rights. It remains one of the warmest memories in my own and my parents' hearts. It was this character which I think also made Brian such a strong judge. His unique capacity to see himself on the same level as those who appeared before him in court and of those whose cases he was deciding made him special. He paid equal and fair respect to everyone he listened before deciding, he discussed all points of view and perspectives, and he thought deeply of what was right, epitomizing by his person and by his ways, the concept of justice. This, me this leads me to, to the second point I wanted to speak about, which is his refreshing approach towards the law. Although I could speak about a number of enlightening conversations we had over the cases we heard together while at the Supreme Court, including many cases that have already been discussed at length, I'd like instead to read out to you a beautifully crafted paragraph from El Ghazuli, one of the judgments which Brian wrote during my time with him at the court. This is paragraph 144 of the case. Law, whether enacted or developed through the common law, if it is operating as it should, must be responsive to society's contemporary needs, standards, and values. It is a commonplace that these are in a state of constant change. That is an essential part of the human condition and experience. As a deeper understanding of the human psyche and the enlightenment of society increase with the onward march of education, tolerance, and forbearance in relation to our fellow citizens, the law must march step by step with that progress. I am convinced that the adjustment to the common law, which I propose, reflects the contemporary standards and values of our society. The strength of his opinion in the self-renewing force of the law made the other, ju other judges hesitant. They had ended up not agreeing with him on the common law point. And although he did, in his usual style, engage in numerous discussion, discussions with his peers, he knew deep down that he was right and he stood his ground. So to me, Brian was a rock, an anchor, 
with his sharp intelligence, his collaborative ethos, and yet his confidence in what was right and what was just, and his courage to stand by that, irrespective of anything. And most of all, he was a friend, he was a husband, a father and a grandfather, which gave him reason to be. As his cards to me always noted, familia semper amicizia. Thank you for listening. Gosh, thank you very much. This has become, it is, as expected, a very moving event. Um, and I'm going to turn to our last contributor, but not least, um, Manjit Gill, QC, barrister at number five chambers, specializing in constitutional public human rights and international law, um, and uh, a former member of the Bar Council's Immigration Practitioners Accreditation Board, and heavily involved in setting up the Discrimination Law Association. Manjit. Thank you, Srini. It's um, rare for a judge to command not just respect, many do that, but also a fondness from the uh, profession that is so evident in the contributions we've heard today. I think it's perhaps even harder for a judge to achieve this in England if he has not grown up at the English bar and bench, but Brian Carr achieved it effortlessly. This, as we've heard, and as we know, was undoubtedly due to his unassuming manner, a ready sense of humor, and a willingness not to take himself too seriously. Whenever a new judge is, is appointed, particularly in the apex court, we as lawyers always try to guess what their impact is likely to be. This was pretty apparent in his case from the outset. My first experience of him was not actually in person at all. I was working with the same junior in two cases at the Belfast Court of Appeal um, quite some time ago. One was a short interim hearing, the other was a full hearing. My junior, a member of the local bar there, now a local judge there, I think, went and did the interim hearing whilst I stayed in the conference room preparing for the full hearing, which was before a different constitution. The junior came back 20 minutes later so, or so saying the interim hearing had in fact been before the Lord Chief Justice, who had expressed his extreme disappointment at not seeing me. Now, this, of course, my appearance was, of course, wholly unnecessary on interim hearing, but this was just his quiet way of sending back a message that he had noticed that I was involved in the case and indeed had another full hearing for another constitution that day. And he wanted to just make sure that I was felt welcome. That was a small measure of his attentiveness and kindliness. The next time I saw him was in the Supreme Court. He didn't take long to make his presence there felt. For those who knew only a little of his background prior to that point, it, it soon became apparent that he did not readily intend to toe the standard line. He developed a reputation for dissenting as we've heard, which he sometimes protested was an unfair label. At one public lecture of his that I attended, he, he spent a good few of the opening minutes protesting that it was in fact Lord Wilson and not he who was the more prolific dissenter. But I'm afraid like all who protest too much, he was definitely guilty of the charge, um, much to his credit, I have to say. There has been a long and, and strong history of religious dissent in this country it exerted a powerful influence on social and political liberalization in the 19th century, not perhaps far removed from certain human rights developments. Knowing little of Northern Ireland, I'm afraid I'm not sure how that played out there. I've wondered, however, what impact it might have had on the development of a lawyer with liberal tendencies but working in a religious sectarian divide, does that make you cautious? Or does it make you dissent even more loudly? Luckily, it seems to have done nothing to dampen Brian Kerr's willingness to ask the awkward questions. 
this, in my view, is a particularly important, perhaps his most important legacy. The law and progress generally thrives on dissent. It's a topic that I've discussed on other occasions in other symposia. In a legal system built on the doctrine of precedent, the role of dissent needs to be much better understood, and I would say protected. And Lord Kerr has contributed in no small measure to that. As Tom just said, dissents are often not truly dissents in a deeper sense. They often have a much deeper impact on the court than appears. Most obviously, the Apex Court has been troubled over the last couple of decades in terms of defining its own role in the area of human rights in particular. This has led to a very significant debate, as we all know, about the role of proportionality. In, in, in one lecture, um, he described himself as a proportionality nerd, which rather surprised me because he was the most un-nerd-like of judges that I've come across. It, it was a common theme of his that whilst respect should be accorded to the views of public bodies, including the executive, it's always for the court to assess the weight to be attached to convention rights in any given context. This, I think, is particularly apparent in the Lord Carlisle case, where he showed the weakness of the speculative concerns about the risks arising from denying entry to a prominent critic of the Iranian regime, giving rise to clear discomfort felt by other judges in disagreeing with him, underlining the point that Tom was just making. It's apparent also in the Hesham Ali case, as we've heard in relation to the exclusion of foreign criminals. It's also apparent in ZH Tanzania and a range of other cases after that, but in ZH Tanzania to begin with, where the best interest of the children of those who would otherwise be expelled were given a preeminence by him, which others then tried to row back from. And it's apparent in numerous other cases. In all of this, he forced those around him to examine their own reactions to such controversial French questions. I shall miss him greatly. Of course, he was a great liberalizing force, but more than that, he was a great humanizing force on all those around him. One should never be fearful of how things may change, but that said, I suspect another Brian Kerr who can act as the conscience of the court is not likely to emerge for some time. Thank you. Sorry, thank you very much, uh, Manjit. Um, and that does bring us to the end of our e evening. There is so much to say about a man of Lord Kerr's stature and reputation with it, which a short evening such as this barely begins to capture. Um, I'm going to end with more from Lord Reed, which I hope does capture something of his, of Lord Kerr's legacy. Um, through his judgments, and this is what Lord Reed says, through his judgments and during hearings, Brian demonstrated his strong and instinctive sense of justice and his thoughtful and principled approach to resolving legal problems. He will never know uh, the full extent of the impact which his considerate, good-humoured and encouraging nature had on the court, the staff of the court and his judicial colleagues. Uh, nor will he ever know the full extent of the impact which his judgments had on the society we serve in Northern Ireland, in the rest of the United Kingdom, in Europe through his service as an ad hoc judge on the European Court of Human Rights, and in the many jurisdictions around the world for which the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council serves as the final Court of Appeal. But he has left us a legacy which will be drawn on well into the future. Brian was a deeply valued colleague, a kind and modest man, of the utmost integrity, who will be deeply missed by all those uh, who had the pleasure of working with him. I think it's uh, difficult to express it better. And I want to thank all of our speakers for your incredible contributions, uh, really bringing to life the work and the man uh, that Alor Kerr was um, and how much he was valued and loved by his legal community. And I want to thank the Kerr family for joining us today. And I want to also thank all of those who participated or attended today 
Um, thank you very much for joining us. I hope you have found this uh, evening as inspiring and moving as I certainly have. I also need to thank the Hoga Lovells again for hosting us on their Zoom platform. So with that, I just want to say good night to everyone and thank you very much again. <laughs>